morning. Um, so I'll share a story um, about sort of also how, how I, as an economist who studies development and questions of poverty and poverty alleviation, uh, got in, engulfed in sort of thinking about um, health access and, and sort of uptake of vaccines as an example of this. So we'll take the story to, to West Africa. Um, and it's a large group of people. So in, 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 in a lot of the work that I do, we collaborate with NGOs, with sometimes the private sector and governments, and donors on learning about change. And learning about change when it is happening. So not looking back ex post, but very similar to a medical trial, look at sort of real-time evaluation of, of events. So we did this with the Ministry of uh, of health, um, uh, a few of our, 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 our research teams, um, and, and an international NGO uh, co concerned worldwide, who had been working with the ministry already. Inspired by this map, where the color scheme indicates vaccine uptake across the globe, this is in April 2020. And starkly, it is the question, why is Africa so red? Why are uptake rates in Africa in sort of the, the single, or maybe it's like below 20%, right? So that has inspired us to ask the question, you know, there are several causes. And one of those is, you know, um, there are supply chain failures. People are not prioritizing distribution to low income countries, right? As an, one obvious case. But then some would say, well, no, but they're at airports. We just saw previous evidence too. We've wasted doses that were available in places. Um, so we said, okay, you know, maybe, maybe you know, some people were, were suggesting this is due to hesitancy. It's available. People don't want it. It's, uh, pe people have all sorts of conspiracy theory ideas. So we did a big survey with a now even larger group of people, and we systematically documented hesitancy in 11 different countries. And uh, when we put all those, you know, all these researchers had been um, collecting data before the pandemic. And for many of those people, we had phone numbers. So we could call them up in a safe way and say, look, if a vaccine was available, would you take it? Right? The standard hesitancy question. And 80% would say, sure. And 80% on average across all those low-income countries. The outlier was, was the US and Russia, where vaccine hesitancy answers were much lower. So maybe if we believe the data is true, then, then it's not a hesitancy problem. Maybe there are other things going on. Um, and we said, okay, well, here's one reason. This is a typical day in the field for much of our teams. It is very hard to reach remote places. And if you're in rural Africa, then you have to deal with high transportation costs. And thank God there was a, a, um, a vaccine center available at my university, but I wasn't willing to travel to Paris to get a vaccine to protect my dad. If it takes... A week's wage, right? We're at, at sort of just below poverty line for many of these places. So living below $2 a day. If it takes half or a week's wage to get to a place and it takes a day, would you go? Well, maybe for Ebola, but maybe not for COVID. So if, it's, if this is the challenge, then maybe it's really related to access much more than information campaigns. And governments at that time and, and, um, and advocates were promoting this idea that we should be providing uh, better information, we should be providing nudges, we should be providing digital media. So we said, okay, to prove a point that we feel is pretty obvious, let's, let's do this. So we designed a very simple cluster randomized trial where we selected 150 rural villages. And to 100 of those, that should say, I don't know what happened with the text here, that should say control, and on the right side it should say last mile delivery. Obvious point, we put the nurse of the government with the vaccine on the back of a bike, if we can't get there by car. And we basically make sort of the access constraint go away. Right? So we went to remote places. Typically, vaccines would be available, even pretty decentralized, at, at community health posts or health clinics or MCHPs, and of which there are a lot. All the purple dots here are health clinics. But still, many people live quite far away from this and suffer that so transportation cost. So step one is 
meet with community leaders, right? So there's all these ideas that, that were presented just before, all taken on board. We just give the project a maximum chance to succeed. We engage with local leaders and get their permission. We um, sort of socialize with the team this idea on immunization in a big community meeting. We do a lot of work to sort of get as many people as possible to the meeting and address their concerns. Even in some places, we address their concerns in private. Uh, we could talk more about those details, details later. And then there is the, the team. Uh, so there's a, this is the social mobilization team of the ministry. And then here is the, the nurses team going on remote places uh, pretty far away. This is a good road you see in the middle right here um, to basically set up shop for two to three days. The whole typical thing with registration cards, um, with uh, the, the waiting period after, just a typical uh, vaccine campaign, right? But it's now inside your village. Um, so it had, had all this. Okay, so um, maybe not surprising, results were very big. On the left side, we see the vaccine rate in villages without the program. So on average, 6% of people were vaccinated before the program. And the red bar is what's added. So we're going from roughly six to uh, a sort of intent to treat estimate of about 26 percentage points. Now this, this had one, one feature, a rate requires you to know a denominator, but there's no list available in these places. You can't go in and say, well, give me the latest census or give me all the names so I know the value that I should divide the total number of shots by. So we did a listing exercise ourselves. Turns out we missed a lot of people. So now this is maybe even the more compelling slide. This is the number of people that actually showed up beyond those who are registered in our census. The ones registered in our census are, are those. But twice as many people show up to get a shot. They either come from other villages or we just missed them somehow in our registration. These are temporary migrants that weren't residents, but they were still there. These are returnees. These are people that otherwise maybe didn't fit our poor definition of what's in your household, because that was a staggered approach of censusing. Now the vaccination increase is even much larger, right, by this count. So effects are high, and the costs were pretty low. Our, the red line is our effect size compared to uh, sort of a systematic review of other studies on not just COVID vaccines, but a whole bunch of other vaccines and different approaches that they tried to increase vaccination uptake. So we're looking at information campaigns or education campaigns or providing incentives or um, et cetera. So they're all listed sort of in these groups below. We are pretty on the high end of uptake. Now, of course, maybe we're going to places with a low baseline. So we're at the tail end of some distribution. But there's no case here to say we shouldn't prioritize these types of, you know, sort of fundamental structural impediments to uptake. In terms of cost effectiveness, we're somewhere pretty on the lower end. So I'm translating here a, it took us about $33 per shot uh, in current prices. If we then take all the studies in a systematic review that reported prices, and then shame on everybody not reporting prices. There's a really small subset here of all the studies that we looked at. Of the 200, these are the only ones that reported studies. And some authors are doing really great because they Garfinkel appears here maybe four or five times of different types of interventions right, in the same study, but each reporting the costs. So if there's one big message out of today, it is access by message to report your costs. We should be thinking about this in terms of cost effectiveness. Is it worth spending the money compared to spending the money on something else? As the Dutch say, you can only spend a euro once. We're doing pretty good. On the top end are cheap nudging campaigns. Those are the ones in green we call them communications. Going further down, we even have the most expensive one, which is like giving high prizes to people to actually get shots. Okay, so that's the first part of the results I wanted to say. Now, where do we take this? Um, in my bio, it said I worked on development. Now I'm really intrigued by this question of access to health and cost effectiveness. And uh, if we break down the 32 or $33 per vaccinated person, most of the costs is coming from these variable costs of going to a place. 
actually most of the cost is basically the car, the driver, and the fuel. So a natural next question is to say, can we maximize on this margin, right? So we have a strategy here that is sort of a proof of concept that we can get large numbers vaccinated at a pretty cost-effective rate compared to other studies. It is then interesting to say, what is the sort of, if conditional on going out there, what else can we do? What can we bundle together? Because now we did all this work and we only put one vaccine in the box, the COVID vaccine. Now we're moving to a post-COVID world, maybe we should write prioritize on other things. So my final thoughts will be on those. And when we're particularly in this case, which is off the charts in terms of uh, under five mortalities, is one of the record holders in the world, then we should be thinking about child and maternal health interventions, right? So then the economist way of thinking about this in terms of disability adjusted life years, that's DALIs in short, you know, what maximizes what we can do per dollar? And this is a great moment for everybody's feedback for me for the next few days, because this is what we're designing right now. So we got a new project in local Creo, it's called Maclat Don't Come, the vaccine has come, thinking about this idea of scaling health interventions. So we'll be doing a similar project as before, but now maximizing the health gains per dollar that we spend. Really thinking about this from a cost effectiveness. We have, again, this collaboration with uh, a large NGO that has experience with the Ministry of Health. Not every Ministry of Health is easy to work with, but we're using sort of a uh, consortium of researchers as well as practitioners to together come up with a strategy. So what we're be informing ourselves with in the next few weeks is what are priorities for the Ministry of Health? What are priorities from a public health perspective? And what do we know is very cost effective? What gives, what is already a proven set of strategies that can increase health for, for children and women? So think about other types of immunizations for those rural populations but also potentially adding a new malaria vaccine, which is probably an interesting question on its own. We wouldn't just be interested in the health gains. I mean, there's a, a recent WHO um, approval of the vaccine and its efficacy seems to be pretty good. But of course, our real interest in the later run will be when you save lives, what does that mean for economic outcomes, right? And that'll be behind us for all these different things, but it's maybe most obvious for the number one killer in West Africa. But also think about you know, improving antenatal care, high blood pressure is an is a, a acute cause of concern for mothers, but also thinking about bundling in terms of additional things for supplements. So think about vitamin A for kids, think about deworming, think about water quality. So what supplementary activities can you do and the same trip when you're going in addition to increasing vaccines? And so here's a set of questions um, that I'd love input on. So. The first question I mentioned is what is the sort of the cost effectiveness of a bundle? Um, maybe given our experience, not to focus only on the rate in a village, but these things are attractive, other people show up. So do we feel that, we call those spillovers. I know that from a virological perspective, spillovers is reserved for something spilling over from animals to humans. Here we call spillovers things that spill over from one unit to the other. So maybe that's thinking about uh, surrounding villages in our implementation strategy. Um, and whether we bundle in behavioral change campaigns or whether we study the efficacy of those. I'd love to debate whether you know, we should just maximize um, the program and its chance to succeed in the terms of effects by giving it all the lessons learned on behavioral change, or is that actually an open question, right? What's the relative merit of doing this extra sort of behavioral change mobilization and, and targeting? Um, and also thinking about targeting within villages, right? Can we optimize on who is reached and how, what do we do in terms of strategies to reach those sets of populations? Okay, the final thing is um, the question I mentioned about malaria. Um, and I think from a sort of behavioral perspective, I'm interested in these sets of questions when I have a change in the, the probability of mor morbidity or the probability of mortality for me or me and my family. What does it mean for sort of mapping behaviors across different types of domains, right? We know that when risk is reduced in certain places, does that spill over to other types of behaviors that I have? So I think that's from a pure behavioral perspective, something we'd love to nest into learning about how people make decisions and do change. I give this, yield the last six seconds <laughs> back to you. All right.
Thanks.